Our speaker today is Kostar Sen. He is from MS-19 batch. He is also the outgoing convener of Firetime. He is going to talk about his summer internship. He did a summer internship in the German Aerospace Center in Berlin this year. And the topic as you can see is water on Mars. It's not bad. So I would like to welcome Kostar. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kostov Sen, I am <coughs> an MS-90 and as Ritam said, I am going to be talking to you about my research which I did this year, this summer in Berlin. So I am, well by, by practice my field is what we call astrobiology, it's a very, I've, I have a lot of uh, MS-22 themselves have said they have never heard of this field before. So what I'll be doing is, for the first part of this talk, I'll talk about what we do in this field, like exactly what you know, how, what kind of research is done, and then I'll get into the nitty-gritty details of my research. So, uh, as I said again, I'm an astrobiologist. Astrobiology, uh, as we like to call ourselves, we are alien hunters. We look for aliens out in the universe, and what we are primarily looking for is life like ourselves. Right? So we want to we consider ourselves intelligent life forms, pretty narcissistic, but yes, we are intelligent. And we want to see if we are alone in this universe and why we are unique. So for starters, you know the, the we astrobiology is you know a very umbrella term. Right? There's, there's a lot of other subfields, there's physics, chemistry, math, biology, philosophy, there's everything into this. Anything you're inter like interested in, you will find something to do with astrobiology. Okay, so I'll start with a very, very deep question, like my text of my talk. I want uh, you guys to tell me what you think life is. What is like a key word you would define life as? What would you look for to say that this chalk is life and I am life? Anything, any words that come to your mind? Yeah. So by like, observation, some sort of activity, like metabolism. Okay, better body activities. Anything else? The response to external stimulus. Response, okay. Consciousness. Consciousness, that's interesting. Reproduction. Reproduction, okay. Okay, you stick to this one, okay? So let's let's deal with this one at a time. Let's let's talk about reproduction. If an organism is able to reproduce, if one can become two, then it is considered life. So if I take my car at home, I break it down and make two smaller cars with it, it's technically one thing that's given to, is my car life? Would you consider my car life? You should stimuli. Let's say there is a person in a vegetative state, would they be considered life? Yes. They are still alive, right? In a way. That's a very, I mean, that's an added question, but in a biological sense, we do still consider them life. Yes. So we can cut this as well. Metabolism, we have life forms that, you know, are stagnant. We have life forms that don't show any metabolic activity over a long period of time. We have bias, for example. They don't really show any metabolic activity unless they have RNA to, you know, deal with, right? Or we have uh, these organisms which are found in ice in Antarctica and stuff, which they have been, they have been standing for a long, long time, right? And now if you take them out and they're exposed to heat, they will restart their metabolic activity. So the answer to what is life is we don't know. We have no idea how to classify life. We don't know what we can consider life. And in in a sense, as any astrobiologist will tell you, is that if anyone and any alien were to look at Earth, and you just saw cars, you would define cars as life, right? A car has every single criteria that we define life as. If I have an immortal being, you would still consider life. There is no real definition. It's a very philosophical question. It's an ongoing, continuous, you know, uh, research. So we don't have any particular strong definition for what life is, but we have one rule for what we want. So as I said, our ultimate goal is to find something like ourselves. We want something like humans, like something like can think like us, something that can build like us. We want to find life like ourselves. 
and we know the only reference we have for life like ourselves is Earth. We only know what happens on Earth. We can only talk about incidents, about events that happen on Earth, and we gain inspiration from that and extrapolate that to other planets. So, rule number one of astrobiology of finding the aliens is all on the water. So, if I were to look at a different planet, I saw an artificial intelligence robot, there is no way I can say that that is not life. Right? So if that is created naturally, nobody here can question that that is life. If that was created by some natural process, that is not life. But even if that was not created naturally, that means some intelligent organism has created that. Right? So as alien hunters, we don't really look for aliens, we look for indication of aliens. We look for things that can tell us that there are you know, other life forms there. And the primary thing that we know is absolutely essential is water. We know that so a, a kind of a kind of basic basic definition of life is that anything, any assembly of molecules that can move on its own, that can move independently, we we'll call that life. Okay. So yes, in that definition, a car is life, a robot is life, but we will we are only as I said, we are only looking for indications that life exists. Okay. Okay. So all the water we know that life has to be somewhere. Life cannot just be floating out there in space, right? It has to be, and we know that because we want to follow the water, because we want, we are looking for some collection of molecules that can move on their own. It cannot be on a star, it cannot be inside a black hole. What we look for are planets, right? So we look for planets, and we know that they need to be rocky planets. Because the gaseous planets cannot, I mean, what would you do? How do you stand on gas? So, they just, we look for rocky planets, right? Okay. Now we come to the interesting part. When you're looking for aliens or you're looking for life, all you can do is, you know, reduce your search area, right? So the universe is vast, there's so many places you can find life, but you want to reduce your area. So there are obviously a lot of stars in the universe. We have different types of stars. We have O, B, A, F, G, K. M, right? Red is something? Okay. These are the biggest and the brighter version, and these are the smaller and the cooler version. These are very hot, they have a lot of fuel, they have a lot of energy. And again, as I said, we are looking for intelligent lives like ourselves. We know that from our star is a G type star, okay? So we know that from the time of creation of the Earth to today, there has been some, I don't know, I'm just going to give a random number, 100 billion years since, or let's say, let's say 4 billion years, okay? 4 billion years, it took 4 billion years for the earth to become today, and in these 4 billion years, humans were evolved, right? Somewhere we started to obviously, but it took this much time for, you know, to create an environment where humans could evolve, where we could be created. And that is the exact reason why we can eliminate any kind of stars which are of this type. O, B and A are very you know, energetic, they have a lot of fuel. But that also means when you have a lot of fuel, you also run through the fuel faster. So it, it, the, they just you know, die out very soon and their lifetime will end here. So you don't have enough time for intelligent life forms to evolve. Okay? So we can pick up these out. Right? So there we go. Step one, we have shortened down uh, a kind of we have shortened down, narrowed down our list of stars. We are only interested in these kind of stars, <laughs> right? Now, in these stars, okay, let's say solar system is not the only solar system in the universe. There are various other systems. We are interested in those systems. We have a star. We have obviously we give off some heat, some energy. And as I said, this is the brighter version. This is the less bright version. So as you go here, away from the star, the temperature cools down. And there is one particular temperature away from the star where it's neither too hot, that water will evaporate, neither it's too cold, where water will become ice. Right? So this is what we call the Goldilocks zone. So every star has a Goldilocks zone, has a Goldilocks radius in which water can exist in liquid form. And our solar system has three planets in the Goldilocks radius, Venus, Earth and Mars. Right? And every other planet in the universe, every other system, we also have their own set of planets. So we have dealt with, I think, two topics so far. 
Astrobiology involves philosophy, and astrobiology involves astronomy. And right now, okay, we have, we have you know eliminated all these stars. And then something weird happens when you and this is just a little bit diversion, but something really weird happens when you actually look at the stars. We have looked at all a lot of a lot of solar systems in the universe. And what we notice is that this is the sun or the, the star. The nearest planet is a planet the size of Jupiter. It's that big. And this is existed in a lot of systems. You know, it's, it's like a majority of the solar systems have a very big Jupiter-sized planet where Mercury should be. So we assume that that is the norm, that is what it means to be, that is the expected thing. And why we don't have a Jupiter there is another story, it's called the Grand Act model, it's a different thing, but it's really interesting to know that the biggest planets, I mean, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, okay, so when you create a planet, the biggest ones tend to go closer to the sun. Okay, so these are the hottest planets, they're the biggest ones. Now, we have identified which stars can have my alien systems. We will now try to identify if the stars have planets or not. Okay? So there are various methods to identify planets. First is the most obvious look there, you will find a planet, it's called astrophotometry. You just take a photograph. There is also other ways, so you have a star. Every, you just look at the intensity of the star, every time a planet crosses, it will be a dip. In the intensity, you know there is a planet there. Next, we also know that uh, if there are a set of planets, let's say the star is facing us, there are a set of planets around it. Uh, the center of mass without the planets would be here. If the planets are not there, it, the, the sun itself or the star itself will revolve around a common center of mass. So that means that this will go around like that. And so as the sun comes towards us, it's you know, there'll be a Doppler effect. Right? It's just a change in frequency. Sun comes close, we see a red shift. Sun comes close, farther, we see a blue shift. Okay? So, yeah. So that's how we identify planets. So, step two, we have identified planets. We have identified systems where there are planets. So now we, are, we have planets. Okay? We have planets where we can have systems. Now, the Goldilocks zone. Okay, so with that, with the radial velocity thing, we can also find out the distance of the planets. Checking the angular, you know, the okay. measurements and stuff. You can measure the distance as well. Cool. I can tell you there are planets here, but the Goldilocks zone is a really weird little zone, right? Because beyond the Goldilocks zone, Jupiter, for example, is beyond the Goldilocks zone. So liquid water cannot exist there, it would be in the form of ices. But the problem is that beyond the Goldilocks zone, we have what is known as the cryogenic zone. In the cryogenic zone, it's a place where liquid water cannot exist. It is solid, we know that. But some planets have internal heating mechanisms. They have, you know, radiation from below that can heat up the water. Okay? And so, uh, for example, there is a mission called Cassini. It's still, I'm not sure if it's still ongoing. But nevertheless, it has identified a lot of moons of Jupiter. Right? So what it does is it just looks at the moon and sees it wobble and you know there's a liquid ocean inside the... There's an entire ocean inside these, uh, you know, these, these, these moons. Right? So if you, can, if you can drill through you will find oceans and there are heating mechanisms, there is water, there is heat, they, they, that is the most incredibly plausible excuse for life we have. There is, I mean, that is where, that is our juiciest example, that is where we have life. Okay, so it, it's a Goldilocks zone, so it is a planet which is not in the Goldilocks zone, it is not in, immediately eliminated. We then look if it has any heat signatures, if we can see anything, any way for it to have liquid water, if it has internal heating mechanisms. Okay, so we have now identified planets that can have life, cool. So that, this, this part involves a lot of astrophysics, I'll just like, okay. Now, now that you have planets, the next step, right? Remember that the first rule is find the water. How do you find water on a planet? It's just a little dot in the universe. How do you really look for water, right? The answer is you don't. You don't look for water. You look for what we call biosignatures. Okay? And this is a whole field of science. So, the idea is that there is a sun, 
there is a planet, the planet has an atmosphere, okay? Light goes through the atmosphere, it comes out of the atmosphere, we are here on Earth, okay? We collect that light, light, then we run it through a mass spectrometer, and you can see what, is, what kind of you know, molecules are in there. You can see the chemical composition, the concentration, the amount of the molecules, and it's, it's a very interesting thing. Okay. But what do you do with this data? Right? So, for example, this is where uh, we have the biggest handicap that we know of. You can only tell, you can only talk about what we know from the planets that we observe. So, let's say we observe a lot of carbon dioxide. Okay, let's say there's like 70% carbon dioxide. That will not be, so will you, will you say that there is, okay, okay, let's, let's, let me take a step back. Imagine I see a planet out there with 21% oxygen. Right? Would you claim that there is life there? No, not yet. Not Why would we not claim that there is life there? Because just because we have, you know, that okay, oxygen is something we can take in, that plant sometimes is the inverse process. Not sure, it's not a signature of life on its own. Here's the thing, right? So, in any planet out there, there is either life or there is no life. Right? These are the only two possible things. We know, okay, let's say there's a planet for A with 21% oxygen and a planet B with 78% CO2, right? If I see 78% CO2, I'll be like, man, this planet is not worth it. Why? Because I know of a natural process that can generate 78% carbon dioxide. These are called volcanic eruptions. You know, from the inside of the planet they erupt and you know they really release so much carbon dioxide. I know these processes exist. I've seen them on Venus. I can tell you that this doesn't mean that there is life. But I don't know of any abiotic process that can produce 21% oxygen. There is no volcanic eruption, there is no what we call serpentine, serpentinization, there is no natural process that can produce this much oxygen. Since I don't know any natural process, I don't know any abiotic process that can produce so much oxygen, that only means that there has to be some biotic process that can produce oxygen. Right? Scientists believe that there is some kind of biotic metabolic activity happening in the Venus atmosphere. Right? We're not saying it's like that, it is just a belief that there is, it's a very interesting subfield. Right? So we have studied the atmosphere, we have of Venus, and we have said that, okay, I don't know anything that can produce this much phosphine, there must be life form. So we don't, we are not saying that every metabolic activity has to be oxygen carbon dioxide, but anything that cannot be produced abiotically has to be produced biotically. That we don't know. That's just shortening it up. Okay. Uh, so this is obviously spectroscopy, chemistry, blah blah blah. I mean, it's a very weird division of things. But and that brings me to my last part. Now that we have these biomolecules, uh, we do also study something called, okay, I don't know if you know what LUCA is. It's a very interesting organism. It is the father of all multicellular organisms. It's where life first started. So the last universal common ancestor, LUCA, there is very active research going on in this, and I know one lab in Isaac Pune that does research on what kind of life form LUCA could have been. Uh, and LUCA is interesting because what we want to do is we want to find out how we went from a soup of ammonia and uh, phosphorus and sodium and oxygen to a whole organism, right? And this involves something called assembly theory. It's about how these things came together. There are very interesting papers about how uh, there is a clay model that can do the very same thing. They, the, there is a clay particle that can assemble together and they can break, they can grow, they can break apart, they can make current other clays, break apart. So we would consider that life as well, right? It's doing everything that we know normal life can do. So assembly theory uh, studies about how uh, you know really the, the life forms collect together. And we have, so, so yeah, uh, there is a lot of biology, we do study biosignatures, we need to know what happens and one of the projects I did last year involved studying <coughs> molecules called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAH, right? PAHs are basically very, very big carbon molecules 
Uh, and what I worked on was to sort them out into, it's a very machine learning clustering algorithm coding stuff, but point was that we could actually see where uh, a certain type of pH molecules were, and what we were interested in pH molecules that had ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide, and okay, so pH molecules are molecules that when they are irrigated by UV light, so when UV light comes on them, they break down, right? So we believe that pH molecules are the biggest sources of biomolecules. They produce ammonia when they break down, and we're interested in them. So effectively, if you look out in the universe and find, uh, let's say, a dense cloud or a nebula where there is pH molecules with ammonia, you would expect a planet with life, or at least life forms, or a primordial soup close by. Okay. So that is, in summary, everything that astrophysicists do. There's a lot of some labs that they do work in, and with that, I will move on to what I have done. What I did was to look for water on Mars. So, uh, okay, I'll just you know this. Uh, so, fine. Mars is a very, 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 very interesting planet. It is in the Goldilocks zone. It has to have water. So, Mars has what we call as Martian outflow channels. If you actually look at the map of Mars. Mm -mm. Process. Uh, yeah. So you said that there is no abiotic process by which you can have 24% oxygen. Correct. So if you have a lot of water, mm -hmm. the oxygen has to have formed from something. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a lot of water, so the water comes first. Right? You need a certain amount of. You need oxygen for water. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if so, that can life exist without water because. You can, is there a, basically a masking, can you have 21% oxygen and life and not have water? So the reason we need water is because of what I call the assembly theory, right? So water is a universal solid, it requires this to like connect the molecules together. Right, so water was there from the very beginning, it's just we don't know how it came about, but water is definitely a necessity to connect these molecules. Right, so how much oxygen is there on Mars? Approximately, do we know? I think 2%, I'm not sure. But I know there is oxygen and it's very little. So but it's possible to get it naturally. But there is water. That is my, that is the way that we come to that result. Yes. So if okay. we find life, yes. is it more likely to be humanoid or like bacterial or? Bacterial, yes. For now, yes. I mean, if you're talking about mass, that's all I can talk about. Yes. Not, not just mass, like in all of the examples. You are not going to find uh, bacterial or any kind of life with the technology we have right now. You are only going to find indications that life exists. Yeah. After that, we'll send them radio messages, hi, what's up, and they, if they get one response back, then we'll further the response. So, yeah, I have questions to slow them down. Uh, okay, so whether they'll be bacteria or humanoid, we don't care. They're both aliens to us. Okay? So, we will, I mean, if the bacteria can send out radio messages, if they can type on computers, if they can code in Julia, that's good for them. Otherwise, you are the, as long as it works, it works. We just want to know why we are alone. We have not found any indication of life yet. We just, if we find bacteria, we'll be just as happy as if we find humans. Because we are not alone, we can say that we don't have to have an existential crisis there. Whatever. Okay. Uh, so anyways, this is the map of Mars. It's very well made. There are districts, there are volcanoes, there are basins. I love this small planet. And here, okay. here is what you call the Martian outflow channels. Okay. So Martian outflow channels are basically depressions on the planet. And uh, these kind of depressions can only come about if there was a certain amount of, there was a flood, okay? We know that there are indications of a flood that was washed across that part of the planet and scarred the planet, okay? So there was a flood there, and looking at the Martian outflow channels, we can tell that um, the, the planet had a global equivalent layer of 0.5 to 1 kilometer thick water, which means that if I have this planet, and I cover the entire Mars with the water that could have produced this kind of a scar, it would be at least half a kilometer thick. Okay, so if I take all that water that was once upon a time on Mars, spread across, half a kilometer. Let me just kind of clarify here that we do know for a fact, and I can tell you this with 100% guarantee that there was water once on Mars. We have hydrated minerals, we have, uh, we have, uh, okay, so in this, I'll come to the second part later. We have hydrated minerals, we have outflow channels, and in these basins, these basins are basically places where there was a lot of volcanic activity. You can actually see some kind of 
white uh, stuff. You know, kind of white, white areas around this place, and we do believe that they are subsurface ice. Okay. So, as I said, uh, so we do know that there was water once upon a time on Mars. Okay. And there was water, but and there are uh, escape mechanisms for water as well. It can go to the atmosphere. It can run away via. It, it, it can basically, you know, be absorbed by the hydrated minerals, which happened. But the primary period when these water mechanisms. Okay, so so let's let's take the timeline of Mars. So it was created here, and we are here today. This is somewhere. This is today. Okay. This is when uh, the Martian outflow channels. Uh, were created, and this is when this kind of period is when the primary escape mechanisms happen, right? So water via the atmosphere. So if the atmosphere is thin, it's easier to escape. There are other processes, and this is when the water escape mechanisms happen, and this is when it is created. So we do think that since that, since this it, 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 uh, the escape mechanism predates the creation of MOC, uh, we think that most of the water. And there are estimates of 90 to 95 percent still exist on the planet today. We don't have anything on the surface, but there is a okay. So 90 to 95 percent, so about 5 percent to 10 percent are via hydrogen minerals that exist. But 90 to 95 percent has gone into the subsurface in two areas. Okay, and this is a little uh, interesting. So this is like let's say this as the whole planet of Mars, uh, and. Within the subsurface, right? It's obviously okay. So the temperature goes up from the surface to the core. Okay, it's very cold here. It's very hot here, and the water that escapes will be in a kind of zone called the cryogenic zone. Okay, the cryogenic zone is basically a kind of uh, it, it, it's basically a, I mean it's, it's an ice uh, layer within, within the surface, right? This ice layer has a certain capacity, right? It has holes, it has holes in it, and water stays in these cryogenic area. So they're just considered like a uh, kind of just area under the surface, and there are holes in it. Water can stay in it. If the water capacity, if the capacity of the cryosphere is uh, less than the amount of water that there is, then the water that is not in the cryosphere will be out as liquid water. Okay, so that it, it can either be ice or it cannot be ice. It can be water. Okay, so if it's not in the cryosphere, it's a liquid water. And right now, the there is another there was a lab right next to mine that was working on doing estimating the cryospheric volume, uh, but that's not what I was doing. So okay, so it is locked in the cryosphere, and we know. Okay, so obviously, I'm sure everyone knows uh, planets crust. There is the mantle. And there is the core, right? So, uh, uh, core. Okay. So we are interested in this particular layer, right? So within the crust and mantle, uh, this is where its stuff is exchanged with the crust. This is just the heating source, right? So the our uh, radiogenic, our radioactive heating sources are in the mantle. We are not very concerned with what's happening in the core. Cool. So okay. Uh, so the below the surface, you don't have harmful radiation. You have radioactive heating, and if you have liquid water, as I said before, you have everything you need for life, right? But again, it won't be. We don't expect like a whole ocean under the surface of Mars. We know there is no ocean. It's more of tiny, tiny droplets, where pockets of the place where you can expect life. Okay. Uh, so this is not a unique study. This has been done before. I have just done it. Better. Uh, so there's Clifford et al. in 2010. What he did was to assume that surface other uh, that okay he assumed three melting temperatures of water, 203, 252, and 273. He made an assumption of a surface heat flow, and he assumed variable thermal conductivity. What we did in our project was to remove the melting temperature. Right. So we didn't assume any melting temperature. I'll tell you how we resolved that. Surface heat flow was also resolved, but we kept the variable thermal conductivity because it is a very good assumption. Uh, and these are the estimates he has. We we'll revisit these values later with our better model. Okay, so uh, ice. Ice is a very, very uh, weird molecule. 
Okay, water is a very weird molecule. Ice exists in six different uh, forms depending on your pressure and temperature. So in here you can see how many can you see? One, two, three, four, five. There's other on the other side, but that's what we are concerned about. We are concerned about this boundary between liquid water and the ice form. Okay, so depending on your pressure and your temperature, water can exist in six different types of ice and one type of water. And okay, right? So this is a very well studied uh, equation. There is a uh, <coughs> so this is parameterized, and what we want to do is so that's the equation of the whole curve, right? So a a t naught c and a t naught c are just the constants. And okay, fine. So right now what I have is a pressure versus temperature curve for the ice water boundary. Okay, pressure temperature curve for the ice water boundary, and here is what we are going to use that for. So, so in this project, we use a software called Gaia. Gaia is a thermal evolution simulation software, and I'll tell you how it works. What we do is we take a whole planet, cut it up into cells. Okay, so first we we'll cut it up into these layers. And then we'll cut each layer into further cells. We call them grid cells. Okay. So we have a modern uh, Martian topographical gravitational data. We just know what mass is supposed to look like today. Okay. So we know what mass is supposed to look like today, and we assume some random conditions in the beginning of mass. Okay. So we have a model. We have these cells. I'll give you. I'll give you this uniform. Uniform distribution of temperature, and we'll basically perturb the system so that means I'll give it a disturbance and see how it changes. Okay, so I have a planet, random planet, but it's constrained by uh, today's data. So you have to change the planet has to change, but it has to give me as, as an end result today's topographical and gravitational data. Okay, so I'm sorry that those are a lot of words. Point was that. <coughs> We all know that I have, as I said, I have a pressure versus temperature curve for ice and water, right? Everyone with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Uh, pressure is equal to rho G Z, where Z is the depth, G is gravitation, uh, and uh, rho is a, is, a, is a density of the crust. So we took three models, right, with different rows, with different uh, density of the crust, and as I said, I have divided the planet up into smaller cells. Effectively, I, I take for so there are there are uh, I will give you the numbers right here. I divide the planet of Mars into 68 uh, layers, and each layer is divided into 40962 cells. I know these numbers because I've been working on them again and again. Okay, so each also there are 68 layers, and each of them has 40926 cells. Okay, so I'm basically cutting up the planet. And, then, and every every one of these cells is basically a matrix. So they all have some data elements. They have the value of in, in spherical coordinates. They have phi, theta of the whole thing, right? So so you notice that the the cells that are in one line, all these cells will have the same value of phi and theta. They just have different R values, right? So I will take all the cells with the same phi and theta value and make one single matrix with them. So what I have here is I have extracted a part of the planet with depth, right? So I have, I, have the, I have the temperature versus... So what I have in here is the depth. And as I said, Gaia is a thermal evolution model, so it will calculate the temperature. So in these 68 cells, it will give you the temperature in each of them, will be 68. Right, so I have the temperature in the other cells. And I have 40926. 962 such matrices. Okay, I have, I have those many such grids. Okay, so for every one of these grids, I'm going to pluck it out and I'm going to check what's happening here. I have the depth, which means via this formula, I also have the pressure. Okay, so I have the pressure, I have the temperature. I can tell you the pressure at every point, and I have this plot of pressure and temperature of the ice water curve. Okay, so you have two things: you have the pressure and temperature for the planet and pressure temperature for the ice water curve. The blue line gives you the pressure temperature for the planet, 
red line gives us the pressure temperature of an ice water curve. You see where they intersect, right? So this is the first point where you will find liquid water. Okay, so here it is weight you need. Okay, so the red line shows how much temperature and pressure you need for liquid water to exist. So at this point, this is the true temperature, this is the temperature you need. So it's actually too cold for liquid water to exist, so it will be ice above this. <laughs> at this point, this is the temperature you have, this is the temperature you need. So below this, it's hot enough for liquid water to exist. Okay, and we did think about uh, restricting it further by seeing where it will become a gas, but Turns out it wasn't necessary. So the intersection of the curve is what I'm interested in, right? And that is effectively, that's it. That is what the whole project is about, right? Just find the intersection of two curves. That's pretty much it. And then the action issue is generating this data, generating these plots, and seeing what, what like, yeah, just, just working with data. But, uh, okay, so uh, this map here is just, a color plot of the crustal thickness, right? So you will find that uh, it, it, it's, it's reducing. I'm, I'm sure it's a little blurry, but these areas. So it, it just, it's just, I've taken the surface, the first layer, layer number one, and as I said, you get a lot of data from every cell. I have taken crustal thickness, mapped them onto the on the rectangle, and these areas are areas very, which are very thin, right? And then I'm going to show you a uh, map of Mars, right? So this is generated just by the except for obviously constraints. And this is what the planet looks like. So you can see that where there's a basin, there's a Hellas basin, there's a Rotopia basin. Okay. okay. Rotopia basin, Hellas basin, you will see that there are areas where the dust is very thin. Okay? And when you look at uh, 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 when you look at volcanic regions like this, where's the volcanic? Okay. So Tartus Mons, these are volcanic uh, regions. Olympus Mons is the biggest volcano in the solar system, and yeah, they are very interesting volcanoes. But those volcanic regions also are areas where the crust is particularly thick, right? So that's that's really interesting that we can really map mass. The, the whole surface of mass can be mapped by just knowing its crustal thickness, and that applies. So this is this is model data, and this is actual data. So we can apply it inversely as well. If I can actually tell you what the map of mass looks like, I can very accurately uh, tell you what the crustal thickness is. Right? So we can't actually measure the crustal thickness, but just by looking at this map, maybe we can. Okay? We use present-day thermal state, uh, state obtained from the global scale 3D evolution models. So, 3D evolution models have been used here. Uh, these models include a surface temperature, so this, uh, this is what the surface temperature looks like. It's a cosine function, as you can see. So in the middle, it's very hot. On the equator, it's very hot, and on the poles, it's very cold. Okay. So it, it's a very simple map. It's obviously not very right. Uh, and okay. So we have used present-day thermal state. Uh, these models include surface temperature, crustal thickness variations, and a low thermal conductivity of the crust. Okay. So um, I want to talk about the blanketing effect. The crust is. <coughs> It's a very nice thing. Okay. So, so, so let's say this is the planet. I will just take a little bit of the surface, okay? And this is what the crust looks like, okay? So, effectively, the crustal thickness and the thermal conductivity of the crust are directly proportional. So, if I have a very thick crust in some areas, which is like the volcanic areas, they are very thick crust areas. That also means that any heat I generate, okay, and, and, and I need you guys to pay attention to this because this is a very, very fundamental rule in planetary sciences. So, uh, if I have a very, <laughs> okay, if I have a very thick crust, yeah, it will be a poor conductor, right? So, thick crust means poor conductor, one second. Yeah, and uh, that means that any heat that is generated at that point in the internal of the uh, the planet <coughs> will not escape very easily when the crust is thick. Okay, so that means that heat generated no escape. Cool. 
Okay, so it, it, it's basically like a blanket, right? I have a very thick blanket, I will feel warmer. If I have a thin blanket, I have, I'll be cooler. If I have a thick crust, okay. if I have a thick crust, it will be the heat will be trapped inside. If I have a thin crust, it will be cold inside. Yes. Can you please one second repeat from thermal conductivity what you concluded? Okay, so let's say I have a thick crust. Okay, that means I have a lower thermal conductivity. So it will not conduct very easily. So think of it like a, a small wire, right? If I have a, if a thin wire here, very easy to conduct. But if a very thin wire, like, it will take a long time. It has a lot of, a lot of obstacles to go through before it goes. Okay. So heat generated inside in the internals, internal part of the system, thick crust means it won't escape very easily. No thermal conductivity, right? So that means that the heat generated inside will have a bigger obstacle to escape. Okay, so there is more heat trapped inside the planet when the crust is thick. More heat trapped means the when I when I okay. So let's say okay, this is nice. Here the crust is obviously very exaggeratedly thick. Okay? So it's very thick here. So if I take if I extract this particular profile and then I look at it, it will have a lot more heat trapped inside. This particular profile will have heat trapped inside. So that means the this, this in general will be a lot hotter than this particular matrix. It has both of them are the same size, but this will be a lot cooler. Okay? So this will be a lot hotter, which means the hotter temperatures will this and near the surface it will be much more hotter. Okay? Since it's much more hotter, I will find liquid water closer to the surface. Okay? So thick crust, lower thermal conductivity. Heat does not escape, heat trap, heat trap means hotter temperature closer to the surface, hotter temperature closer to the surface, liquid water closer to the surface. Okay? Fundamental rule, thick crust, liquid water close to the surface. Okay? It's a very, very interesting phenomenon, it's called the blanketing effect. And that is what we model. And so as I said, right, it's very interesting to see that. The crustal thickness maps to the map of mass. Okay? Right now note that the crustal thickness will give you the map of mass. If the crustal thickness is directly proportional to the water depth, right? So if a thicker crust means the water depth is lesser, then the water depth should ideally also map to a map of mass. Okay? So then that is what kind of what we observe here. So as I said, there are three different models of mass with different crustal <coughs> thicknesses. So we have taken a crustal thickness of, uh, sorry, a crustal density of 2550 kg per meter cube, 3000 kg per meter cube, and also a dichotomy model, which means that the northern hemisphere has uh, 3000 and the southern hemisphere, the blue is 3000, the pink is 2600. Okay, three models. 2550, 3000, and both, kind of. <coughs> Okay. And these are the water depths you observe. I will tell you the values. So effectively I showed you Hellas Basin has a very thin crust. The volcanic regions have a very thin crust. Right? In the Hellas Basin, you observe that the water depth is very high, it's about 17 kilometers. And in the volcanic region it's very low, it's about 2.7 kilometers. Yes. So again. The crustal thickness has mapped to a map of mass, but the water depth has also mapped to a map of mass. <coughs> right? Uh, these are three different models. Your yeah, okay. So <laughs> we have observed distances as low as 2.72 and at the equator obviously, but I just want to you know just emphasize the point that the crustal thickness really is the is the guy that is affecting all this. It is the person that is telling you that where the liquid water is, right? So as I said, surface. If you can just look at the surface, the gravitational data, the topographical data, you can find out the crustal thickness, and by the crustal thickness, you can you can find out the liquid water depth, right? In inside the surface of the planet. Okay, so that's one part done. We have started the basic thermal evolution models for sine surface temperatures and we have generated stagnant drop on the map. So this means that you know the water we are assuming is just stays there. Right? So this doesn't tell you that water is there, but this does tell you that this is the earliest point where you can find water. Right? Beyond this depth, we there, not be there, we have we know of certain parameters that we have to model to get to know that, but 
I'll come back to that later. So, uh, I, I told you that the first set of models, the first three maps, okay, these have different crustal densities but the same crustal conductivity. Right? Conductivity is how, how well it can conduct. Now what will change is the crustal conductivity. Again, uh, for the 2550, we see the so when you when you when you reduce the conductivity, we have changed it from 3 to 2. So the crust conductivity lowered, right? So it becomes a poorer conductor of heat. Right? So so in these maps, when you see the earliest uh, the earliest depth in the volcanic region is 2.72, it has a conductivity of 3. In these maps, the conductivity of 2. So it's it's a it's a much poorer conductor of heat. So it will trap the heat inside, the heat will stay inside, and that's why the depth in, it's much hotter inside the planet. So you have the water temperature will be it'll be higher, the hot it'll be hotter inside the planet, so the the depth you require for water to be liquid will be closer to the surface. And you see 1.91 kilometers of the water depth. And the what and I'm, 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 what the I mean the basic point of trying to write here is that the average variation, the average crustal thickness or the density of mass is 2550, somewhere between 2550 and 3000. And uh, we, we do see a dichotomy model in some areas. So dichotomy model is a more real representation of what a planet looks like. Um, and we also, the, the crustal conductivity of the planet is also between 2 and 3, right? So effectively what I'm going to say is that if you again split this map into 40962 cells and then pick out you know what, what where it's 2, where it's 3, where it's 2550, where it's 3000, you pick them out and you again remap them, you will find a more realistic map of mass. But this is this is just basic version. Mm -hmm. And okay, so right now we have modeled stagnant ones, okay? And here is another map of mass, and the next thing we have done is to see how the water depth changes with time, right? I told you that via is a thermal simulation software, thermal evolution simulation software, so with time, it will give you how the planet's thermal history changes, how it becomes from a very cold to a very hot, or from a hot to cold, how it changes, and I can also tell you how the water depth changes. So we are right now only looking at the basins, there are four basins, the Utopia basin, the Isilis basin, Hellas basin, and the Arja basin. Four basins, and Let's see what it looks like. So, as I said, there are three models: three five five zero and um, two thousand, no, two five five zero, three thousand, and the dichotomy model. And you can see that. So, this is where we start the model. It's as you can see, the start point is the same, almost the same for everyone, right? So, we, so all the all the systems get a uniform initial condition, but they get different final conditions. The where to stop is different. Perturbation of the system. So, the first thing will be a jump. And you can see that with time, the planet is becoming colder, and that's why the water depth is becoming deeper. Uh, yeah, so it's just getting deeper and deeper into the planet. Because the planet getting the surface is getting colder and colder, that's just how planet planets work. Okay, now we look at the volcanic areas. There's the Elysium Mons, the Alba Mons, the Olympus Mons, and the Tharsis uh, area. And the again, it is the same trend, but what we want to really see are that um, you know uh, the whole the depth variation, and that's another thing this I have done. Is that turns out that I mean if you look at the range theory, you'll see that volcanic ranges again it has been over time it has been closer to the surface than um, it has been for the basins. So the basins are somewhere around from 1500 to 2000, and this one you know it varies a lot more. Okay. So, because that's heat is you know it has a very thicker crust, so it's hot on side. Okay. Uh, okay. Two part two done and right. So I told you that there are, we have taken six models so far, right? Two five five zero three thousand and dichotomy and two kilo or two a crustal conductivity of two and a crustal conductivity of three, right? There are six models we have looked at so far, but the you know, the, the conductivity of a crust in a planet is not going to be the same everywhere in the planet, right? It's not going to be the same for every point. <laughs> and we need a way to tell that, uh, that you know, to basically vary the conductivity, right? So what we are going to do, and 
this is my uh, main contribution to the project portal. Okay, what portal does is that so 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 what we can do is and this was this was done in Clifford et al as well. Um, okay, it was either two or three. A new crystal conductivity. We have implemented the portal function. Uh, okay, okay, equation time. Right? Math is important. I will add it to it. All right. Uh, uh, okay, so we we know that mass has a crust that is made of a material called basalt. Okay, and we use these equations to effectively measure the porosity. Right. So Kt is the thermal conductivity. Kh is the hydrate conductivity. And phi gives the porosity, right? So we have a crust. We have pores in the crust. These pores will be filled with gas called hydrates. Okay, hydrates. So what this equation does is it gives the total conductivity of the crust by modeling the hydrate and the modeling the norm. So this is the rest of the whole thing is just buzzard. Normal buzzard, okay. So buzzard has holes inside. The holes are filled with hydrate. Okay. So as you can see, Kh is the thermal conductivity of the hydrate raised to the power of the porous number, of, like the amount of pores, and the pores vary with depth. So there is a phi naught, which is the porous constant, constant, and minus z by d. D is another constant, but z is the depth. So as you go deeper, the number of pores decreases. Okay, it's pretty intuitive. As you go deeper, material gets more compact, things get more dense. There will be lesser pores. Okay, so you have hydrates that leads to the number of four uh, pores, and you have the thermal conductivity, which is leads to the number of not pores, one minus the uh, pores, and that's how we you know vary the crustal uh, conductivity. Okay, by the pores. Uh, the temperature dependent Kt assumes that the thermal conductivity is generally equal to or greater than water ice. <coughs> so the Clifford paper that I was talking about in 2010 10, assumed that dense basalt has a thermal condu conductivity equal to water ice, but uh, at larger temperatures we see very small conductivities. It's effectively what I'm saying is that Clifford did a big error made a mistake, it is not the same and what we have done is to take a better model and uh, in a paper called Halbert et al. Okay, so I, I, no, I don't know if I can show you where Clifford's is. Oh, okay, so this triangle here is uh, Clifford. This black line here is actual data that we measured and the best fit that we have is Halbert et al. Okay, so you can obviously see that Clifford's data and this is the measured data, very bad. Right? Halbert et al. Very nice. Okay. So uh, that. Okay. So so we have, we have taken. Uh, so it's been it's been parameterized by Jordan has Hannah. This is a new equation that we're using for KT. So effectively the Clifford equations are right. Okay. But instead of taking the thermal conductivity of basalt as equal to water ice, we will take it to what these two dudes measured, Jordan and Hannah. Okay. So. Uh, they have given this equation, we have just replaced it, and now we have three more models, right? So, what do I get saying here? Uh, 2550 as the crust uh, density. And what you can see is when we have a porous, when we include variable conductivity, the water is so much closer to the surface, right? So, as we improve our models and get them more realistic, we can see that I think at the course they are around 1.4, but it stays in this range, right? Whereas for, for uh, for the lower conductivity, right, when it's hot in there, it's still a little more, and the deepest parts you can see are in the three parts per cell. So, uh, yeah, so for the for the variable the conductivity, you can see 1.42 is the least, and the minimum depth is 2.38 for 2 and 3.67 for 3, right? So that the last model is one of is the better end of the models, and we have obtained the shallowest groundwater models for that. Okay, so these are all the nine models compared side by side. Uh, you can see obviously that it's, it's, it's the, the closest to the surface is where it's variable, but uh, the deepest points are also at, at the highest thermal conductivity, it's uniform. Okay, 
very nice maps, very good maps. We see Mars, nice. Okay, so till now we have assumed that uh, water is stagnant. We're just looking for these tiny droplets in in the planet. Put a rover on the planet and drill into the equator. You'll eventually find liquid water. Let's look for areas there. Happy. But if the water happens to be connected, okay, and, and they are they are being pulled via just the gravitational density and nothing more. If they are connected, you will notice that they actually fall into the basin areas, right? So it, it, it's where the water is deepest and where, where the crust is the thinnest that the water will flow to. So in the event that they flow, okay, uh, they will end up in the basin areas, which is where the water is very, which is yeah, which is not where you want to dig for water because water is deep. So, but again, you don't expect really uh, these many flow channels to be there. It's just uh, it's just a map I made for fun. And okay, so in the beginning I told you that this is what the cosines of the temperatures look like. It's very hot here, very cold here. That map there is what the actual cosine is. It's what actual surface temperature looks like. Okay. So I mean, we we, we thought that we what we can do is so this is towards the August, right? We thought we can use the second map to constrain the surface better to find deeper points. But as you can see, it's not a very very big variation in terms of latitude wise. It's, it's, it will not make a huge difference to the map. And so we decided to <coughs> not do it. And that is the uh, orange zone. We are, we are still uh, waiting to, you know, it, it, it's just something for the future. Okay. So, conclusions. Uh, we know that the crustal thickness variations affect the first order, uh, first order the groundwater depth. So, as I, as I told you right now, crustal thickness, groundwater depth, direct relation. Uh, we've implemented a variable, variable, variable crustal thermal conductivity. A new variable thermal conductivity leads to a more shallow groundwater table. We have observed that. We have seen that uh, maps of the groundwater flow were comp computed to show where the direction would flow if the groundwater table was connected. And the the whole uh, entire goal for this was to you know create a Python processing model. So you don't you don't have to really use this for Mars. You can use this for other planets as well. There are other systems waiting that can be simulated by Gaia. There is Venus. There is Enceladus. There is. Uh, other moons and satellites out there, which you can use to, you know, um, uh, you know, simulate and the, the data, the, the Python <coughs> scripts are ready to use for those kinds. Of stuff. So in Clifford et al., how did we, how did we improve upon it? Instead of assuming a uniform heat flow, we use thermal 3D thermal evolution models, which I showed how you can explain. We use more recent experimental data, so his is old, and. Uh, the min-max variations uh, in our models are 1.1 to 5.5 at the equator to 6.1 to 18.5. But for him, he he had a much shallower depth. Sorry, he had a much deeper depth. So 2.3 to 7 at the equator and 6.5 to 12.5 at the poles. Right. So if you want to look for water, look in the equator. Best bet. And Outlook, so surface temperature in the past, if if it's warmer, right? So so it, as I show you the whole plots about evolution time, if it's warmer, the groundwater is closer to the surface. And uh, the calculations only use pure water ice. Oh yeah, this is another thing, this is another thing for the future. That they've only used pure water ice, but uh, we have not considered brine solutions. There are, you know, it's not just pure basalt, there's also salt inside the planet, so that would again uh, lead to, it, it would melt uh, ice and it would raise the groundwater depth. So if you actually consider soil as well, groundwater depth goes up. And with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you all for listening.